When a patient has dermatomyositis but doesn't have muscle disease, you really have to rely on the skin findings. And so the typical skin findings you would see are ideally the pathognomonic features, which are Gotrin's papules and the heliotrope eruption. But unfortunately, in some patients, those can be subtle or those can be challenging uh, to diagnose. And so with the heliotrope, for example, people are often looking for a pure violaceous hue, when in fact it can actually be subtle pink erythema, especially in our lighter skin patients. And then in terms of the hands, in terms of Gotrin's papules, people are often looking for violaceous pure papules, which are raised right over the knuckles, when in fact those can be a little more macular, they can actually spread down the digits, um, they can have this very classically psoriasiform scale on them, and therefore that can also lead to a misdiagnosis. And then if those features still have you confused, um, I really like to rely on the nail fold findings, in which we can see a lot of features. We look for dilated capillary loops, drop out of capillary loops, um, ragged cuticles, dystrophic cuticles, cuticular hypertrophy, et cetera. And then of course you can look elsewhere on their skin exam for clues that can help you. Probably the one that will help the most is photodistributed uh, erythema that can be more pink or more purple, um, scalp disease, et cetera. The challenge is, in, is that patients with amyopathic dermatomyositis often get misdiagnosed as lupus because they have a photosensitive rash that can often affect the mid face and they don't have muscle disease at the time that they present to your office. And then the challenge is if someone wants to do a biopsy of that skin eruption and they are looking for lupus, the pathology is identical in the skin to that of lupus. So both lupus of the skin and dermatomyositis will show this vacuolar interface dermatitis, which is essentially inflammation at the junction of the epidermis and the dermis, and then mucin in the dermis. And so if you get that result back, your pathologist could tell you, yes, this is consistent with lupus, and you could sort of go down the wrong pathway. And so what I encourage clinicians to do is anytime they see a biopsy of the skin that's read as lupus, to just always add dermatomyositis in your clinical differential, look back at the patient to help you really distinguish which one does this patient actually have. The nice thing is that the facial erythema in both patients involves the mid face, but in dermatomyositis patients, it very classically hugs or involves the nasolabial folds. Whereas in our systemic lupus patients, when they have the malar rash, the erythema on the cheeks spares those nasolabial folds. And so that's an excellent distinction. So in our amyopathic patients, first we have to think about who can we really consider has you know, skin limited or amyopathic disease. And so someone we has provisional amyopathic disease when they have had rash with no muscle disease for six months. So then we can call them provisional. And at two years of rash with no muscle disease, we can call them confirmed amyopathic disease. And so when you think about a true amyopathic patient, despite the fact that they have no muscle disease, they still are at a risk for lung disease in particular. So these patients still need pulmonary function tests with diffusion capacity to screen them for lung involvement. And very importantly, they can still have an associated malignancy. So they still need a cancer workup, similar to one of your dermatomyositis patients who does have muscle disease, which sort of brings home the point why it's so critical to um, recognize these skin findings because you can uh, catch lung disease or cancers earlier in those patients if you can make the skin diagnosis. In dermatomyositis, we typically aren't going to rely on topical therapy as sort of our main therapy. It's really only going to be adjunctive. And so in our dermatomyositis skin patients, we really will want to make sure we give them a sufficient quantity to cover the area of skin that's involved. And so typically, if you just write one tube, your patient will only get 15 grams. So you really need to write the exact number of grams that they need. Um, and that's a really important point. And you can also think about the expense to the patient. And so there is a potent topical steroid I frequently prescribe um, called beta-methasone dipropionate. There's a mid-strength called triamcinolone 0.1%, and that actually comes in a one pound jar, or 454 grams. And that can be a really cost-effective way of giving patients a larger quantity of topical steroids if they have a full body eruption that needs to be treated. And then, of course, another really important point with topical steroids is that you really only want to use them on the skin for a certain period of time before taking a break. On the body, we would typically recommend two weeks on and then one week off, whereas on the face, really only max five to seven days at a time, then a week off. 
And if you need to use topical steroids longer on the face, you really want to think about having the patient be on a topical calcineurin inhibitor, such as topical tacrolimus, to make sure you don't get um, skin side effects from topical steroids.